Uh, my name is Don Hubert. I'm the director of the Center for Ethics and Human Values. Um, thank you for coming to this morning's event. Uh, this is part of a program uh, that we call COMPASS, Conversations on Morality, Politics, and Society. Uh, COMPASS is a year-long series of events that raise uh, foundational ethical questions uh, but require disciplinary input from many directions in order to uh, be addressed in an intelligent way. This year's COMPASS program focuses on religion and we've had a whole series of events this year uh, that have looked at issues of uh, religion and public life from, from various perspectives. This will be our last uh, COMPASS program of this year's uh, religion COMPASS. Um, no, there's one on Monday. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, excuse me. There's one on Monday. <laughs> um, I forgot it because we're actually sharing that with another organization that's taking the, doing the heavy lifting on organizing it. <laughs> so it wasn't uh, on my mind. There's another one on Monday, and that is in the <coughs> It's here. There's it's a flyer here. in the back. Okay, there's a flyer in the back. It's in the room, in this room on Monday. Um, this uh, uh, half-day conference, uh, Religion in uh, Global Context, focuses on a number of questions. The, the role of religion in exacerbating uh, conflicts, the role in, of religion in facilitating cooperation, um, uh, and questions such as uh, what role really does religion play in uh, global conflicts and so forth. Um, moderating this morning's uh, first panel is uh, Eric McGilvery, Associate Professor in Political Science. His research and teaching interests center on modern and contemporary political thought with an emphasis on liberal, Republican, small r, Democratic, small d theory, <laughs> um, and uh, the pragmatic philosophical tradition. He's the author of The Invention of Market Freedom. Uh, and reconstructing public reason, and we wish he would reconstruct it more quickly. Uh, uh, Eric is one of the core uh, faculty leaders of the Center for Ethics and, and, and Human Values, and he served this year as the Compass Coordinator, which means that he's responsible for taking the uh, lead on the uh, organization of uh, all of the events that we've had this year, and we thank him for that. It's been a terrific series of events. So Eric, if you would introduce our panelists. Thank you, Don. Good morning, everybody. Um, our first panel, as the program indicates, is on religion and global conflict. Um, our panelists are going to present in the op they're listed alphabetically in the program. They're going to present in the opposite order, just to keep things uh, interesting here at 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I will introduce them in the order in which they're going to present, and then I'll hand the floor over to them. Um, the format is going to be as follows. Each of our speakers is going to speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, sort of lay out, um, in general terms, their thoughts on the issue. That'll be followed by a short, sort of moderated conversation with me up here at the table um, to sort of put the, hopefully put the presentations in conversation with each other. Um, and then we'll open the floor to questions um, from all of you and, and use the rest of our time that way. So we'll try to keep things relatively brief from the front of the room here. Uh, the C in COMPASS stands for conversation. We want to take that seriously and give you all a chance to have your say as well. Um, so without further ado, introducing our speakers. Um, first, we'll hear from William Cavanaugh. Um, professor Cavanaugh is Professor of Catholic Studies and Director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology at DePaul University. His research focuses on the Roman Catholic Church's encounter with social, political, and economic realities, and in particular on the social implications of traditional Catholic beliefs and practices such as the Eucharist. He's the author of six books, including most recently, I think most recently, uh, Field Hospital, The Church's Engagement in Markets, Politics, and Conflict, published in 2016. And before that, and I think probably most relevant to his remarks today, a book called The Myth of Religious Violence, uh, Secular Ideology and the Roots of Modern Conflict, um, published by Oxford in 2009. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jose Casanova. Uh, Jose is professor of sociology and theology and senior fellow at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University. His research focuses on topics such as religion and globalization, migration and religious pluralism, uh, tr uh, transnational religions, and sociological theory. Uh, he, too, is the author of many books, um, including probably most famously Public Religions in the Modern World, published by the University of Chicago in 1994, uh, and most recently, I think, uh, Jesuits and Globalization, Historical Legacies and Contemporary Challenges, um, published by Georgetown in 2016, uh, and co-authored with Thomas Banshoff, and um, a book called Beyond Secularization, Religious and Secular Dynamics in Our Global Age, Global Age published in 2017 in Ukrainian, as a courtesy to those of you who don't speak Ukrainian, I translated the title into English um, for you. Um, so we'll, we'll start with Bill Kavanaugh, and then we'll um, have Jose Casanova after that, so I'll turn it to Bill. I'm gonna stand up here to 
try to keep both of us awake, you and me, uh, both. So um, I got interested in the uh, question of religion and violence when I took a um, political theory course in grad school. It was a seminar on liberal political theory, liberal big L uh, political theory, and we read Rawls and Rorty and uh, Sandel and so on. And I was struck by the um, frequency with which the wars of religion were invoked as a kind of foundational moment for the birth of liberalism. And the way that the story goes is that after the Reformation, Catholics and Protestants were killing each other, and so the liberal state had to be born and step in to separate the two by privatizing religion and then thereby assuring the, the peace. And um, that story comes up over and over in, in these uh, theorists. And so I did my term paper on the wars of religion. And one of the things that you find is that um, after some intensive, our deep archival research, um, by which I mean about five minutes on Wikipedia, you can discover that in the wars of religion, Catholics killed an awful lot of Catholics, and Protestants killed an awful lot of Protestants, and Catholics and Protestants uh, collaborated. And so uh, this, these were not isolated incidents. The Thirty Years' War, for example, the kind of poster child of the worst of the wars of religion, was mostly, at least in its second half, a, a war between the two great Catholic dynasties of uh, Europe and Cardinal Richelieu had, you know, who was a Catholic cardinal, had brought in France on the side of the Lutheran Swedes and so on. And so it gets very uh, complicated. So mo the way that most historians deal with this and the political theorists aren't really reading the history. They don't really know anything about the wars of religion. They just kind of invoke it. Um, but the historians will say, well, obviously in religion is one factor, but there's also other factors political factors and economic factors and social factors and so on. And they try to kind of balance it out that way. But I began to wonder, well, what do you, what do you actually mean by religion? How can you separate religious factors from political factors in Europe in the 16th century? What, is, what would that actually mean? And so I started looking at some of the literature on the genealogy of religion. Wilfred Cantwell Smith's book um, came out in 1962, I think, The Meaning and End of Religion, where he does a genealogy of religion. He goes looking for the concept of religion and doesn't find it anywhere except the modern West. Um, and that's, a, that's an interesting topic. So the, the, the very idea of religion uh, as something which is separable from the secular or from politics or so on is being born in this same period of the so-called wars of religion, and I thought, hmm, there's something, uh, something interesting there. So then I began looking at the literature on the idea that religion causes violence more, general, uh, more generally, and after 9-11 there is this huge explosion of theories as to why religion has this peculiar tendency to promote violence. And um, again, it's all in the context of this kind of the West versus the rest of the world. We are rational and peacemaking, but then there's still these people that take religion seriously in public, and they are uh, therefore more prone to violence and so on. Um, but I began to read genealogies of the concept of religion, and there's been a proliferation of them over the last few decades. And um, it's, so, it's interesting how much of this is done uh, in the context of colonialism. So to make a very long story short, religion uh, is birthed as a concept in Europe and then exported to the rest of the world in the process of colonization. And there's some very interesting work being done on this. The, the explorers reported home with remarkable consistency when they first went out in the early modern period that the natives had no religion at all and then once they were colonized discovered oh actually they do have religion and it serves certain purposes so um, David Chittister's work on religion in South Africa Sarah Tall's work on the invention of religion uh, in Shinto into a religion in Japan um, you have late 19th, early 20th scholars in China saying Confucianism is not a religion and Western scholars saying, oh yes it is. Uh, the BJP, uh, the ruling party in India now says Hinduism is not a religion uh, 
It is much more than that. It's social and political in nature and so on. Uh, and in the meantime, we all think, well, they're, they, they're just silly. They don't know what Hinduism is. Hinduism is clearly one of the major religions. Uh, John Esposito says that uh, to call Islam a religion is to label it an abnormal religion because they don't separate religion and politics, religious and secular in the ways uh, that we do. So all of these ideas are really contested, but they don't stop people in the kind of religion and violence industry um, from assuming that there is this thing called religion and we all know what it is, and it has this peculiar tendency towards violence. It's absolutist, it's divisive, and it's irrational. So in the first chapter of my book, um, I look at nine of these arguments that religion has this peculiar tendency towards violence and try to figure out what religion is. So I don't, I neither try to defend nor attack the idea that religion causes violence because the whole question is what do you mean uh, by religion? So the whole argument depends on this sharp divide where on the one hand you have Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, etc. And on the other hand, those are religions. And then on the other hand, you have politics, economics, Marxism, liberalism, Freudianism, you know, uh, capitalism, et cetera, on the other hand. And so everything depends on the stability of those categories, the religious and the secular. But you begin looking into this literature and you find that, you know, on the one hand, you've got people on this side saying no, Hinduism is not a religion or Islam is not a religion. And on the other hand, you have people on the other high s side saying Marxism is a religion, capitalism is a religion, uh, economics as religion as, uh, what's his name, Robert Nelson's uh, works go, politics as religion, uh, Emilio Gentile's uh, work, um, nationalism as religion, Carlton Hayes's work, and, and the list goes on and on. So you've got things being smuggled back and forth across the border. And, um, and it works depending on the, um, the, the agenda of the, of the author. So you've got Christopher Hitchens, for example, his book, um, uh, God is Not Great, which is subtitled with typical British understatement, How Religion Poisons Everything. And he says that, um, uh, so he, he, you know, in all kinds of indictments of the Inquisition and so on, and then he says, well, but um, what about Marxism, right? Here you have atheists that are responsible for 100 million deaths in the 20th century. Well, he solves this problem by just moving them over to the other side and saying, well, totalitarianism is a religion too. And so Stalin you know, Kim Jong-un, et cetera, they count uh, as religion as well. And at, at the same time, he says Martin Luther King was not really a Christian because he was nonviolent. Um, and so it's, it's really remarkable. Yeah, I'm not making this stuff up. Um, Mark Jurgensmeyer on religion and violence, he's made a whole uh, career of this. But then at other points, he says uh, secularism is a kind of advanced form of religion, which I, I don't know, I, I mean, it just completely scrambles uh, the categories. Martin Marty has an indictment of religion with this peculiar tendency to promote violence, but then he gives 17 different definitions of religion, and then he says, well, we'll never agree on a definition of religion, so I'm just going to give you five features that mark a religion. And then he shows how politics meets all five of the same features. And so, you think, so what then becomes of this religious-secular distinction? Richard Wentz, his book, um, uh, Why Religion, Why People Do Bad Things in the Name of Religion, he just uh, openly expands the category of religion to include not only Islam and Christianity and so on, but football fanaticism, consumerism, liberal humanism, uh, and, and the list goes on and on. He takes a kind of functionalist uh, approach. And so you begin to, to, to look at all of this and you think, um, okay, Something's, something's going on here. So what I basically argue is that people kill for all sorts of things. Um, and there's no essential difference between killing in the name of things that are usually categorized as religion and killing in the name of things that are usually categorized as uh, secular. So there's no essential difference between killing for a god and killing for a flag. And um, this is really nothing more startling than what the Bible says about idolatry, for example. People treat all sorts of things 
uh, as if they were gods. And um, this is a kind of Durkheim functionalist approach that religion is whatever people treat um, as, uh, as religion. So there was, uh, after the rolling blackouts in um, 2001, I think it was, uh, after they deregulated the electrical industry in California, the architect of the deregulation was quoted uh, in the New York Times as saying that he believes in that free markets always work better than state control, and he said, I believe in that as a matter of religious faith. And so I think, well, take him at his word, right? If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck, right? Um, so uh, I do an entire genealogy then in the second chapter of the idea of religion and show how it is this kind of modern Western uh, category. It's not a transhistorical, transcultural thing out there, but the religious secular distinction does political work uh, in our context. And um, what it does usually is kind of divide up the world between things that we see as rational and peacemaking and sensible and things that we see as irrational, divisive, fanatical, and so on. So it's perfectly sensible to kill for one's country. It's perfectly fanatical and irrational to kill uh, for, the, uh, for one's, um, you know, for, for Islam, uh, for example. So the point is not that there's no such thing as religion. There's clearly um, such a thing now, but it's been created as a contingent category, and it's a very malleable uh, category. It's not, um, I sometimes use the analogy then where it's not, religion is not that glass. It's not a thing out there in the world. Religion is these glasses, right? It, the religious secular distinction is a lens through which we view the world. The only problem with that ana analogy is that the, my glasses help me to see better. And uh, oftentimes the religious secular distinction just ser serves to uh, uh, confuse rather than to, um, to enlighten. And so um, the third chapter of the book is an analysis of the so-called wars of religion, uh, which I already talked about a little bit. And the fourth chapter then asks the question, well, if it's so confused, this idea that religion is this transhistorical, transcultural thing that has a peculiar tendency towards violence, if that notion is so confused, why is it so prevalent? Why does everybody say that from academics all the way down to the person on the street? And the, the, reason, the, the reason, I uh, think, is that it's useful. And what it does is basically reinforce um, some of the power structures of uh, Western uh, liberal society uh, by um, authorizing certain kinds of violence and discourse and uh, deauthorizing uh, other kinds of discourse and violence. And I give examples of this. Uh, both in the domestic sphere and in the sphere of foreign policy. In the domestic sphere, I go back and look at every Supreme Court case uh, dealing with the First Amendment, and what you find is that um, right about 1940, there's a pivot. Before 1940, religion is invoked by the Supreme Court as a unitive force in American society, and from 1940 onwards, it's invoked by the Supreme Court as a divisive force in American society. And that is uh, invoked, this, uh, this myth of religious violence is invoked in case after case, outlawing school prayer, uh, forbidding uh, state instruction on private school campuses, um, forbidding the subsidizing parochial school teachers' salaries, uh, and, and on and on. Um, and that happens just about uh, 1940, uh, which is the same, uh, it's the same decision in which the Supreme Court decides that you can force Jehovah's Witnesses to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And the reason is that religion is divisive, nationalism is unitive. And so you can, you can compel uh, um, Jehovah's Witnesses to say the Pledge of Allegiance against their will. Um, uh, and this was in the wake of all kinds of violence that was being done against Being Jehovah's done. Witnesses in the, in the early 1940s. Um, Martin Marty cites this case and cites that violence, and he says this is evidence that religion can cause all kinds of havoc in public. Um, instead of what I think 
the, the real message is that zealous nationalism can cause all kinds of havoc in public. The Jehovah's Witnesses were pacifists. They were the one getting the crap beat out of them and tarred and feathered and castrated and imprisoned and so on uh, throughout the country. But the myth of religious violence serves to, to kind of um, direct attention away from nationalist violence and towards the violence of religion, even though Jehovah's Witnesses, again, were the ones that were getting beat up. Um, and so this becomes a trope then in uh, post-1940s jurisprudence that religion is divisive and causes violence and therefore needs to be marginalized. In foreign policy, uh, the, the myth of religious violence is, is useful, um, especially with regard to the Muslim world, right? Muslims are fanatical. They have not learned, like we have, to separate religion and politics or religious and secular. And so they continue to mix this volatile substance called religion uh, with politics, and it causes all kinds of havoc. Um, so our violence is reasonable and peacemaking. Their violence is divisive and irrational. And so therefore, we need to regrettably, from time to time, bomb them into the higher rationality. And um, I give lots of examples of this kind of discourse. Sam Harris, one of the famous new atheists, he has a book called The End of Faith, where he has, you know, he criticizes uh, religions for the torturing witches, for example, but then later in the book provides a, an argument for torturing terrorists. And he says very bluntly, he has a chapter called The Problem with Islam, and he said basically you can't reason with these people because they believe crazy, irrational things that can't be proved by science. And so the only way you can deal with them is force. And he actually provides a, an argument for a, fir a nuclear first strike um, and, and also says that um, you know, before we get to that point, we need to encourage democracy, but we can't trust Muslims to vote that in, and so some kind of benign dictatorship is going to be necessary, and so on. So the myth of religious violence becomes uh, 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 apologetic for secular uh, violence, and that's often the way uh, it sometimes works. So what I'm trying to do uh, in this work is level the playing field and say, yes, of course it's the case that um, some Muslims, some Christians, uh, et cetera, use their faith uh, as a way of justifying violence. There's no question about that. Um, but it's also the case that uh, nationalists, capitalists, Marxists, et cetera, things that we usually consider secular have just as much a tendency uh, to use those kinds of uh, commitments to uh, commit violence as well. So trying to kind of level the playing field and argue for a much more empirical approach to these questions rather than creating this abstract, um, very malleable, uh, ridiculous category called religion and then arguing over what um, religion either does or doesn't do. Um, so I, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Jose. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I was glad to let uh, Bill go first because I knew he would set the stage for cleaning up uh, the analytical questions and going into uh, building up on it. So the f I'm going to make three points. The first point I'm going to basically restate what uh, Bill has said but from a different personal context. Uh, and this is that um, I'm a European and I was struck uh, whenever European politicians uh, trying to bring peace to the Middle East will repeat the same foundational myth. Once upon a time, we Europeans also didn't know how to differentiate religion and politics. We were killing each other, the religious wars. But then we developed a secular state and we established uh, peace and liberal freedoms ever after. Um, and I was struck by the fact that Europeans had forgotten all the terrible violence of the 20th century. The 20th century was the most genocidal, catastrophic century in the history of humanity, in Europe. World War I, millions of young people basically massacred at the altar 
of the nation state. You go to any European country, you will see these fantastic monuments to the martyrs of World War I. And those are supposed to be sacred martyrs of the patria, of the patria, of the nation. And then comes, of course, the Bolshevik Revolution and the Gulag and then the Holocaust and the Armenian Genocide. All of those things have nothing to do with religion. And yet when Europeans see, relig see violence elsewhere, they immediately see religion and then remember the forgotten wars of religion of the 16th century to make sense of them. Now the argument I would make is if we see the wars of religion not so much as the wars of religion, but the wars of confessional state formation, which is what they were, you have basically a process whereby all of Northern Europe becomes homogeneous Protestant by getting rid of Catholics, all of Southern Europe becomes homogeneous Catholic by getting rid of Protestants. And in between, you have three bi-confessional societies, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland, couldn't eliminate each other and have to learn somehow how to coexist. So ethno-religious cleansing, which for me begins in 1492 with expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain to create a homogeneous Catholic state with Catholic subjects, is the mother of the Westphalian nation state. That's what it is. And this process then has become globalized. When Westphalia went through colonialism elsewhere, whenever an empire falls apart, the Ottoman Empire, you have the ethno-religious cleansing, Greeks and Turks. When the British Empire in India falls apart, then you have ethno-religious cleansing, Muslims and Hindus. They have been living together for centuries. So when you see Hindu-Muslim conflicts in India, you don't think in terms of precisely nation state and state formation, but you see in terms of religion, that's it. And so I think that this invites us to see this as general process of state formation and the model that comes out of Westphalia of homogeneous, basically, uh, uh, confessional states. Uh, the secular state comes much later. The secular state really only emerges after the French Revolution. Every European state was first a confessional Lutheran, Anglican, Catholic, or, or a Calvinist state. Secularization came much later. So it was not secularization that came out of the religious wars, but confessionalization. Uh, so it is the dynamic of secularization in Europe is confessionalization, the confessionalization. And these dynamics, however, are very different in the rest of the world, precisely because the colonial encounters lead, as, 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 as Bill pointed out, to the encounters of new religions, Christianity and the religions of the natives, and out of it comes the end of the old classification of true and false religion and heretics, schismatics, infidels, and pagans, and the beginning of this differentiation of the world system of religions. But all of them really emerged as such as isms in the 19th century. Even Catholicism and Protestantism as isms are product of the 19th century. No, the word Catholicism did not exist before the 19th century. The word Protestantism didn't exist before the 19th century. Those isms, Buddhism, Confucianism, etc., are really, really products of the 19th century. It doesn't mean there is no religion. And here again, uh, the question is not that religion is simply something invented in the 16th. The word religion, of course, is invented in, from the 16th century on and now has become globalized. When my colleagues in the religious studies say, well, let's get rid of the religion because it has such a genealogical baggage, it's too late. Now it's being used by everybody everywhere in the world. So the task is how it is being used, by whom, and for which purposes. And so let's not use religion. Social scientists, when they think independent variable, religion is not an independent variable. It does not exist. Uh, you have religious groups, religious actors, religious institutions, religious organizations, but religious, not religious in general, but a specific, Buddhist, Christian. And I'm using them again. It's not that those concepts are clear, but insofar as they call themselves Buddhist, is denominationalism, the way people define themselves and are defined by others, denominated. And this is, we are in a process of global denominationalism in which people define themselves as Muslims and Christians, Buddhists, Hindus. And this is part of the dynamic of globalization, which is, again, other than the dynamic of Westphalian state formation. So this, I think, what the moment where we are now in terms of global conflicts that go beyond the conflicts of state formation and domestic violence, majority against minority, is, of course, these confrontations of imagined communities at the global level. And here, of course, the whole debate about Islam is, is, is central. Islam is, is, which for me, again, reminds me so much of the debates about Catholicism in the 19th century.
Uh, Catholics like Muslims today had this Ayatollah in Rome, therefore they could not be good Republican citizens anywhere. They had this religion that was essentialist, anti-modern, anti-liberal, unchanging, and they have these customs, the Irish, you know, and, and, and so on. In the, in the midst of the Kulturkämpfe, of the cultural wars, uh, Catholic, anti-Catholic nativism in the US, in, 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 in Great Britain, in Germany, the arguments against Islam today are the, the same arguments that were made against Catholicism in the 19th century. Why? Now, it doesn't mean there were not good reasons for it, but you have to analyze the dynamic and the dynamic of creating or constructing an image of Islam and how actually the Muslims then, in their response, reproduce the same image. And, and the Catholics were caught in this, in this dynamic in the 19th century. Um, what is very clear, I'm a student of Catholicism like Bill, and it's very clear that Catholicism was radically transformed in the 1960s by the aggiornamento. And the argument I made, if Catholicism can change, any religion can change, believe me. <laughs> and so the argument is, well, Islam is changing dramatically, but it's changing in all kinds of different directions. There are all kinds of aggiornamenti. But in the Catholic sense, it came from above, all the bishops agree, the elites change in one single generation. In the case of Islam, it goes in opposite directions. You have, my first encounter with Islam was when sisters in Islam in Indonesia, a feminist group, invited me to a conference on challenging fundamentalism. If your first encounter with Islam is with Muslim feminists, you are going to be radically, uh, somehow critical of the way in which everybody talks about Islam and feminism. By, by the way, the last book I, I co-edited with uh, as I was one of the commentators was Islam, uh, Gender and Democracy, uh, the newest book, Oxford University Press, last year, because this is a fundamental issue today, the question of Islam and gender and democracy. So, again, but it's true that we are having as a new in global conflicts, a new type of conflict that did not exist before, which is non-state actors uh, in global violent settings. And it's not that the techniques are new. Again, most of the, you could say, the anarchies at the end of the 19th century you have a period of about 30, 40 years. You have a lot of legitimations of violence. You read Sorel, Reflections on Violence, and you see how it lasted for about 30 years, and then it disappeared. And then in the 60s, you have all these radical Marxist groups, Red Brigades, and IRAs, and ETAs, and, legit and, and even priests legitimating violence in Colombia. It was part, again, of uh, uh, a global uh, kind of trend. And so you have to understand this dynamic within Islam today is a unique historical moment, not as something which is essential to Islam, but something we need to understand as part of the global historical context and come to terms with it. Probably it will be one or two generations until this issue somehow finds its resolution. I mean, from long-term historical perspective, that's what I would say. But again, in this respect, they are acting no different than what radical secular actors did before, when the anarchies and the red brigades and so on were doing the kinds of violence they were doing also against terrorist violence. Terrorist violence, basically, is not invented by, by, by Muslims. It was invented by secular actors uh, uh, in the 19th and 20th century, I mean, fascists and, 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 and Bolsheviks and so on. Uh, uh, finally, there is something about religion and violence, but it's not about religion in the way we understand it, but about what Durham called the sacred. You could almost, by definition, say, the sacred is whatever has the power to sacralize violence and to turn violence into something legitimate and sacred. Sacrifice. Sacrifice, of course, comes from this, right? The victim of a sacred, a, 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 a victimization which is made sacred by precisely being directed in a particular context. And what is important, and this is part of the argument that Bill was doing, is that in the contemporary world with the religious secular, the religious becomes privatized, the secular becomes sacralized. The sacred nation, the sacred state, sacred citizenship, sacred human rights, and so on and so on. And so uh, whatever gives, if you wish, uh, legitimation for violence is what you could call the sacred. And we know that in the history of religion, if we can talk like that, we, we should not talk that the religion is a history. But in, in the human evolution, in the, in the social historical development, the way in which what we call religion is transformed, obviously this is what people talk about the axial age, 
a new forms of religion that come to desacralize violence. When the prophets in Israel say, I don't want sacrifices, I want your change of heart, and, and basically justice, and so on, not, and the, all the attack on sacred kings, and sacred, and sacred wars, and this is what characterizes the axial age, whether it is Confucianism, whether it is Buddhism. Of course, these critiques of the social sacred in name of something higher, transcendent, that gives a distance from the sacred social context, uh, doesn't have the power enough to, and then all these religions are caught up again in sacralization. Christianity is caught up again with Constantine. The Buddhists become Buddhist kingdoms, sacralizing violence, Confucianism, that all of them basically fail as religions, eventually reemerge uh, already as allies with empires, with the states. Um, today, we are in a context, again, in which religions can be both. Religions can be used, as we know, as for identity construction of us against them, and sacralizing the violence against Adam. Religious populism. No Latinos, they are all rapers, uh, rapists, no Muslims, or whatever. The way the, in, in, in it, play, it plays, or, or white supremacists, for that matter. I mean, you have here a very clear context in which religion on both sides. You have white supremacists using Christianity in Christian symbols, basically for radical violence against, against African Americans. Then you have African Americans using the same resource of religion for nonviolent resistance. And those two aspects of religion are there, are historical uh, uh, contingent. And on the one hand, religion remains today, and we see with the, with the growth of populism everywhere, religious populism basically uh, creating uh, walls creating boundaries and excluding certain people as being less, not being uh, worthy of being with us, whatever. And on the other hand, you have the case that today religion remains one of the most uh, strongest dynamic for transnational, transcultural, trans groups, even encompassing, you could say, uh, ideal humanity. So it is in these dynamics uh, there was a time 50 years ago in which religion was ignored, was considered irrelevant, it, was, it didn't matter. For the social science, religion didn't matter. For international affairs, religion didn't matter. Now we've gone into the opposite extreme. Uh, we got into a secular moral panic. Religion is everywhere. Religion is the problem. Religion is the threat. Uh, we have to be uh, somewhere in between, uh, neither ignorance nor simply secular moral panic, and comes to terms with the way we try to understand every other phenomenon with reasonable comparative historical analysis that, that comes to terms with the complexity of these issues. And of course, it's much simpler if we ourselves use these categories and then for, 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 for action, for uh, uh, exclusion, and so on. So this is basically what uh, the points I wanted to make. Thank you. Okay, that was terrific. Um, thank you both. Um, I want to, again, leave as much time as I can for you all to have your say, but in the spirit of getting things going, I'm going to try to pose two questions, which might end up being the same question. We'll see. Um, the first question is really a, just a personal question, not, not too personal. Um, and then I'll have a, a somewhat more substantive question after that. The personal question is, um, I'm curious, you come from different, well, I'll put it this way, you work in different disciplinary contexts. Um, Bill was a professor of theology, Jose is a Professor of Sociology, more or less. You're both in Roman Catholic institutions currently, but uh, Jose, for many years, was in the New School, uh, which I'm pretty sure is not a Catholic institution. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, as you, as you as scholars have approached the, the problem of religious violence, or the problem of there being a problem of religious violence, um, how you think the fact that you've been mixing with different kinds of colleagues and students, writing maybe for, at least implicitly for different kinds of audiences and so on, using different disciplinary tools to approach the question how that shaped your way of framing, uh, um, framing the question and how it may have led you to think about the question differently. So from a kind of personal point of view, thinking about, again, where you're coming from professionally or in a scholarly sort of sense, how has that uh, uh, sh shaped your ideas on these, on these topics? And I don't mind who goes first. <laughs> I, I have no problem with this. If you want to give some thought, who would you? No, go ahead. Well. Actually, I was in the seminary. Before I became a sociologist, I was a theologian. And I studied theology in Innsbruck, but I was lucky that I was lucky.
I study theology in a Catholic institution at the high point of the Vatican Council where everything was thinkable. So I basically went through the whole training of German Protestant theology from the uh, beginning, from the post-Hegelians all the way to, to the greats of the 20th century, Barth, Bultmann, von Heffer, Tilly, and then contemporary political theology, liberation theology. So I came to sociology already with a the theological base. And I had enough of religion. I really didn't want to, to study religion, not because I was not interested in religion, but because I thought that sociology of religion was a relatively uh, unsophisticated uh, uh, sub-discipline of sociology. Uh, the great founders, obviously, Durkheim and, and Weber, could not be understood without their, 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 the core of their theories is their sociology of religion. And yet this had been forgotten and, and, and was not part of what sociology of religion was. So I actually didn't want to study sociology of religion as a sub-discipline. I didn't want to be examined in sociology of religion. But then people began seeing the so-called religious revival. And I saw a lot of people were saying nonsense about religion, precisely because they had all kinds of these stereotypes that I thought were very, very, very uh, simplistic. So I came back into the field a bit, coming out of a, a leftist journal, Telos, linked to the new school, precisely, and we had a debate about religion there. And it, it, I was surprised how few of the leftist uh, uh, thinkers at the time were still linked to the Enlightenment uh, critique of religion. They were looking for religion as the utopian potential for revolution, for liberation. Uh, no working class anymore, perhaps religion can do it. And I thought both positions, the one of hoping that religion will be kind of the utopian redeemer and hoping that, or the other one, of feeling religion as, 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 the, as the darkness that, that uh, uh, threatens the liberation of humanity. I think both were problematic perspectives. So I came back into the field a bit. Uh, uh, and I, but I remember when my colleagues said, you are going to a dead end. Where, where are you going to the sociology of religion? And then they would tell me 10 years, ah, you were lucky. You went to the field when nobody was there, and so you could, you could excel in the, in the sociology of religion. <laughs> I said, well, you know. And then, but really what, what made the difference for me is, and this was for me the move from, from uh, the new school. The new school was very much still a, a social science in the German tradition, enlightenment, rationalism, and so on. Uh, leftist, but without any kind of orthodoxy. And, uh, uh, however, uh, I realized that the social sciences had difficulty coming to terms with the new global condition. That we are, we are stuck in the old methodological nationalism, in the division of the social sciences, the humanities, the natural sciences, and simply we couldn't make sense of what goes on in the world by maintaining these rigid disciplinary categories. So I left the new school to become undisciplined. And Georgetown, because has no PhD program in sociology, allowed me to become undisciplined and to think outside of the box, not needing to train people into the discipline of sociology. So, uh, and this allows me to begin thinking in terms of global issues from uh, being more critical of our modernist, uh, 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 Western-centric perspectives on, on the world, and, and so. Yeah, I... Um, I started out as an undergraduate at Notre Dame as a chemical engineering uh, major and then uh, got hooked on theology. I was interested in it and um, uh, got a master's at Cambridge and then went and lived in Chile uh, under the Pinochet dictatorship in a uh, slum area of Santiago for a couple of years. And there it was undeniable that the kind of the uh, religious and the political were densely uh, intertwined and the church became the kind of only place where organized resistance against Pinochet could take place and so on and it was a very interesting time to be there and I went from there to um, uh, graduate school at Duke and uh, discovered that uh, my enthusiasm for th the relevance of theology was not shared by uh, everybody in the academy to say the least. Um, that theology, of course, is not even considered a real discipline by many universities, most universities perhaps, and even at places like Duke, um, it's only kind of allowed to take place uh, in the um, uh, divinity, you know, under the auspices of the divinity school or a, a joint program, the PhD program was a joint program between the divinity school and the religion department, which was supposed to be kind of about a different thing. Um, but in grad school then, um, uh, 
I was taught by professors who didn't think that this, these kind of uh, disciplinary distinctions made a lot of sense. And we were reading um, John Milbank's book, Theology and Social Theory, uh, which came out right when I started uh, PhD work, uh, which is an interesting work. A lot of his subsequent work is kind of loopy, in, in my opinion. But, um, but that's a really uh, interesting book in which he argues basically that uh, s secular social theory is just theology in disguise. And you know he goes back and looks at Durkheim and Weber and Marx and so on, and um, and makes this argument uh, very coherently. And that I think had a really helpful to me effect of kind of leveling the playing field uh, between these different uh, sorts of disciplines. Every discipline has their kind of dogmas, um, and every discipline has uh, their set of sacred scriptures and so on. And um, uh, and that it's much more useful if we uh, uh, don't be too fastidious about policing the boundaries between these uh, different kinds of disciplines. And so that, I think, um, uh, was useful for me when it came to approaching these questions of religion and violence. What exactly is religion? Why is it being cordoned off in this way? What is it being opposed to? And do these kind of boundaries uh, make sense? And so, uh, in a lot of ways, um, this, this movement that Jose talks about, this, the, the narrative is that religion went away and then it came back. And uh, in a lot of ways, I just think um, that that's not true uh, at all. It really never went away, right? It's I, I, a much more useful concept to me is John Bossy, the English historian, uh, his concept of the migration of the holy. Yeah. And, um, and he shows in the early modern period um, uh, how the holy kind of just migrates from uh, you know, church to state and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and in these kind of, you know, much in the way that, uh, that you were saying, you know, now we have sacred state, sacred individual, and, uh, and sacred human rights <coughs> and those kinds of things. And so the idea that the holy migrates uh, seems to me to be much more interesting than the idea um, that you know religion went away and then oh look it's it, it's it's back. So, so my, maybe that leads to my substantive question, which I asked with some hesitation. I mean, it, so the C in couple stands for conversation. The point of the conversation is meant to be to model civil discourse on some kind of topic. This, the problem of discourse being civil only emerges if there's disagreement. Um, and so part of my job as moderator here is to bring out disagreements between the two of you, which is unusually challenging in this case, I think. Um, so, but one thing I thought it sounded like a, a point of contrast between your presentations anyway, and, and if you reject the premise, you could help me then by just saying where you think you disagree, if you do. Um, but I, I, the thrust of Bill's remarks I took to be kind of problematizing the category of religion, which is sort of what you just said, um, and, and saying, do we really know how to use this word, or is it really used consistently, and so on. Whereas the, the thrust of Jose's remarks was to use religion as a kind of category and, and talk about religion and the state and the secular and so on, and, and you know, the, the idea of the sociology of religion, suppose there's something for that to be a sociology of. So I wonder if you do disagree in the kind of, the confidence with which you use the category of religion to kind of organize your thinking about these kinds of issues. And if you don't, again, if you could help me by telling me what you think you do. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's an interesting question. And I think I've, I've kind of been migrating on, on this question as well. Um, I was uh, at Berkeley a few years ago uh, talking to the um, political science department and um, uh, you know, giving a, a lot of this, this kind of analysis. And um, one of them asked me, well, so one of the grad students asked me, well, what do you do with the term religion then? And I said, well, um, I try not to use the term because it's, it produces so much confusion. And then later on, um, it was actually at dinner, um, some of the grad students were saying, look, you're, um, you're pulling the rug out from under us. We tried for years to get this very secular political science department to take religion seriously, and now you're coming along saying, you know, let's not talk about uh, that. And so I think they're right. I, I also had another experience where a guy came up to me. He was in the religious studies department at the University of Virginia. And he said, basically, knock it off, you're going to put me out of a job, right? You know, that's... <laughs> Disciplinary um, thinking. Right. And I think, you know, I, I mean, re the, the idea of religion allows for theology to go on uh, covertly at jo Thomas Jefferson's university, which I just think is brilliant.
and I think, and that's reason enough to not stop using the term religion, uh, in, in, my, in, in my opinion. Um, they actually have some really interesting uh, theologians uh, at the University of Virginia. Um, and, and I think the, the um, grad student was right at, at Berkeley as well, right? I mean, you can't not talk about it. What you need to do is talk about it, but not talk about it as if it's a thing that's just out there, you know, as if I'm just going to give up. And this is what often happens. I was on a, uh, uh, and there was a group that the Mellon Foundation put together on religion and international relations. And it's all, a lot of it is the kind of religion is back crowd, you know, a bunch of great people and everything. Um, and one of the first things they read was my second chapter of that book, The Genealogy of the Concept of Religion. And I, as a friend of mine says, I ran up into a solid wall of affirmation. You know, everybody said, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. You know, no, no argument against it, but then just ignored it and just went on talking about religion as if we all knew what we were talking about and as if it's a thing out there for the rest of the, the seminar. Um, so I, I think we need to talk about it, but we need to problematize it and in every circumstance do what I think Jose was saying too. You, you just think, okay, what work is it doing here? What work is this religious secular distinction doing under these circumstances? Um, is it and it might be relatively benign, um, or is it not so benign? Um, and, and, but, it, but it needs to be at the forefront of any kind of conversation about religion, it needs to be um, a, a kind of deeper understanding of what, what are these terms actually doing uh, in this context and, and why. I mean, I think that what, what for me is very clear that the attempt to develop a general theory of religion or a general definition of religion uh, from a scientific point of view, uh, has failed and is going to fail. Um, even from purely sociology point of view, the two foundations, Weber and Durkheim, are almost incompatible. They, they have radically different premises to start with, and yet we've been trying to develop a theory uniting both of them. It's very problematic. But besides that, when I answer to the critics in religious studies, let's get rid of the category, knowing how complex it is, is genealogy. I said, fine. The problem is that today every constitution in the world defines something as either being protected or forbidden for being religion. Every constitution. So the question is not what is religion, but how is religion constructed by social scientists, by religious leaders, by states and courts, by journalists, by everybody. And what is unique today is that everybody has the right to say, this is what my religion is. So religion is out of the backs of authorities. It's out of the backs, even Islam. I mean, look, <laughs> most of these uh, jihadists have absolutely no legitimation from the point of view of traditional authority, and yet they become uh, global Muslim leaders. So the question is, is the very notion of who defines religion and who has the, the, nobody. So you have here a real, a real uh, context. And this is our global, this is a social fact. That there is no religion, but religion is everywhere and used differently. Religious secular, we know that, in the same way there are multiple religions. There are all kinds of multiple secularisms, which are of course very much related to the opposite, right? So there is the famous joke about Northern Ireland, uh, you know, somebody crossing from a Protestant to a, hands up, who are you? Protestant, or, no, I'm an atheist, but which one? <laughs> so I'm a secular, but which one? A, a Buddhist secular, a Catholic secular, a Protestant, a Muslim secular, because ultimately, if you define yourself against vis-a-vis -vis religion, your definition is going to be vis-a-vis -vis what you define yourself. And, and it was the great contribution of Talal Azar and those who follow him to realize that we have dedicated so much time to the study of religion, but we have no serious attempt to understand what is the secular, what is secularism. So now the most interesting, I argue, uh, research going on is how the religious secular is being constructed differently around the world, in different cultures, in different contexts, and historically has been, and how the very different types of secularism. Within its tradition, even think of laicite, French. The Turks take laicite, but radically different. The Senegal takes laicite, laicite vianantelli, but radically different from the French and from the, and from the Turks. And you could go on to Indian secularism, Indonesian secularism, Chinese secularism, and we are talking of very different 
types of secularism. So, and we know that American French secularism, the two foundational secularism in the West, the two democracies are radically different types of secularism. So, it is how the religious secular is constructed, uh, uh, which is not that what is religious, what is secular, but how those boundaries and how the construction of the dynamics between the two. This is for me the task of the social scientific analysis of, 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 of these social facts. So you've got um, this program on religion and conflict, and the next thing you need to do is a program on secularism and conflict, in okay. other words. Right, I mean, th this is, I mean, you can find on, on the, the web, you know, there, I mean, there's thousands of things that have been written on sure. religion and violence and almost nothing on secularism and violence. They, I, I had a contribution to the Blackwell Companion to Religion and Violence, and I entitled my piece, um, Why This Volume is a Very Bad Idea. And the editor changed the title. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was going to, to be the first chapter of the volume. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, you know, there's a Blackwell companion to religion and violence. There will never be a Blackwell, or who knows, maybe there will be, but there needs to be a Blackwell companion to secularism and violence, and there just, there just isn't. I don't think we've had an event this year where <clears throat> the participants didn't question the premise of the event. <laughs> um, so thank you for making that a, a continuous street. Yeah. But that, if, if, that, if that's the work the program does, great. Right, yeah. I and mean, that's, that's part of what we, what we could be hoping to do in having a series like this. So I appreciate you saying that. That's enough for me, I think. Um, uh, one of our helpful assistants will bring the microphone around. Is it O'Don is my helpful assistant? Okay. Um, so um, just a couple ground rules. Uh, they say to hold the microphone like this, like Mick Jagger, not like this. Like I don't know who holds the microphone like this. Um, and please, in the interest of time and broad participation, no follow-up questions. But if you have a question, please raise your hand, and Don will bring you the microphone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes? Okay. Uh, so in, just a comment in, in relation to the secularism and violence. I think there's, a, there's an extensive literature on that. It's called anti-communism. The discussion oh, of yeah, yeah. Vi violence in, in the Soviet Union and in, in Maoist China and so forth. You know, it's all about how the lack of, of religious restraints unleashes all kinds of violence. So I think it's there. You just need to know where to look. So, uh, my, my question for Professor Casanova is, is uh, I was really interested in, you know, your comment about it, uh, secularism is different in all these uh, different countries. Isn't that the return then of that nationalist state-centered framework um, that you had talked about uh, moving beyond? Well, I, secularism, we have, I mean, I, I've written on the secular as an anthropological category. And how do we understand the secular? So this is one issue, which is basically the, the type of life, world, uh, culture, and how people understand themselves as secular humanists or whatever. Then there is secularism, one at the political level, as a statecraft and the way in which the states deal with religion. So every modern state has to have some kind of secular way of dealing with religion, either controlling it, either uh, managing religious pluralism, pushing it to the private sphere. So this is aspect of secularism, the state center. But then there is the other aspect of, if you wish, ideological notions of theories about religion. Religion is something primitive, it's called to disappear. Religion is something great, which is part of the anthropological world wire. So you have the very, and then you get into then theories of religious past, religious present, religious future, which are basically also linked to secularism. So insofar as, yes, uh, we are a state-centered societies, and insofar as the states have the fundamental uh, task of precisely through constitutionally either allowing or not allowing certain things, uh, and then the way in which religion is one of the key categories of, of those things. I mean, uh, in, let's look at the Sikhs. The Sikhs in, in France will wear a turban and will say, no, no, this is not a religious symbol, it's a cultural symbol, therefore it's not excluded from laicite. They will come to the same Sikhs to the US. Of course it's a religious symbol and therefore protected by the Constitution, right? So I'm not talking even of, of, of I'm talking of the context within which those things take place. But um, it's not only nationalism. I think that today we're in a context in which, and this what was positive of, of Huntington's thesis. Uh, of course, it's not a class of civilizations in the geopolitical territorial sense, but it is the dynamics of uh, imagined communities 
defining themselves, denominating themselves vis-a-vis -vis others. My argument is that today, my argument is that the uh, uh, dynamics of religions with one another are more important for the redefinition of their traditions than each tradition going back to the past. So we are, I mean, every religious tradition today are much more influenced by these dynamics of, of religious relations with the secular and with other religions than by their own historical traditions. But I would go, I think that we've entered a, a, a global stage in which the, the, the nation state is by no means over, it's still there, but when, when I did the project on the Jesuits and globalization, was precisely to argue there is an early modern phase of globalization which is there before Western modernity. And the globalization today is not simply a continuation of Western modernization to the globe. We have entered a new dynamic which has a lot of similarities with the, with the original. And the Jesuits, I'm using them because the Jesuits came with colonial powers everywhere. But once they went beyond the colonial power, they came to Macau. But then once they went to China, they went without power. And they entered a dynamic of conversation, of dialogue with the Confucians. With, uh, in Japan, the same thing. They went to Nagasaki with the Portuguese. But then they were on their own all the way to, to, to Kyoto and in, 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 in India and in Tibet. And so you have the first truly encounter of the West and, and Asian religious and cultures takes place precisely at this level at this time. And they were the first uh, pioneer globalizers, the first group in, organized group in history to think and to act globally. And for me, the thing is why they were suppressed by everybody, every gang up on them because their project of globalization was so against the grain of the Western modernist project gaining hegemony. But today, again, they are interesting group again at the global level. So my point is, uh, it's not only a nationalist, there is other dynamics at the global level of religions that cannot be captured only by the state society dynamics or by the secularist control of religion by states. Hi, thank you very much um, for the presentations. Um, I was wondering if you could comment maybe on um, the um, I guess methodology of studying uh, the sacred or you know, the religious, and um, to what extent do you think that um, the kind of tendency of social science to um, want to define religion as um, you know a, as a phenomenon, as a thing in the world, has to do with its um, its desire to Did you say desire to study the world in a positivist way? Yeah. So, Define um, positivist. Um, I guess uh, as viewing the world as something independent from ourselves as observers, as opposed to um, a, a, an approach that um, is maybe more interpretive or discursive in methodology. Okay. Yeah. You're the social scientist, do <laughs> Well, it's, honestly, it's, it's, a great, it's a great and a very complex question. As you point the phenomenon. Uh, I, my conception of social science is social science is not an objectivistic, uh, positivist social science. It can be, it can be. And, and obviously, you can study anything from this objective third person perspective, but it means uh, some fundamental things. I mean, I think that uh, human phenomena have to be understood, uh, interpreted phenomenologically not only from the perspective of the, of the, of the actor, but certainly uh, some dynamic which is cannot be simply uh, 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 captured by a purely neutral, objective eye. Um, it's language. Without language, you cannot analyze anything. And, 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 and language is not simply something which describes reality, but also shapes and constructs the meaning of reality. Anyhow, so you enter into the whole uh, uh, question of expressivist phenomenological studies of anything human, not only religion, anything human, right? So this is the first step. 
The second is then how do you get to study of the sacred? And here, of course, you have a whole tradition, the end of the 19th century. For the first time, you had the phenomenology from William James to, 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 to Rudolf Otto, different ways of really, really studying religion from some kind of disciplinary way that could be called scientific. Um, but in the case of William James, through not a positivist, but a, 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 a pragmatic uh, conception of the object. And in the case of, of Rudolf Otto, phenomenological analysis. And this has continued this debate until today. I'm now, right now, uh, reading simultaneously two great volumes. One, Christian Smith, Religion, a very serious attempt to develop what I thought is impossible, a general theory of religion. From, a, from what he calls a critical realist perspective, and then Hans Joas, The Power of the Holy, a translation and a reconstruction of the way in which from Hume through William James and, and Durkheim and Trails and Weber, all the present, we have constructed the study of religion. Um, again, ultimately, uh, I think that it's simply a general question of how do we study human phenomena. It's not specifically, you need a specific. What is characteristic of the study of religion uh, is the fact that you have to take seriously uh, the assumption that the religious believers basically consider as real a reality that you may, as a agnostic, as a, a scientist, consider it non-existent. So, but, but then if, if your response is, well, these people are pathologically, whatever, not rational, right? Uh, obviously, it's going to be very problematic. Uh, on the other hand, you cannot take also simply the, the theological dogmatic perspective of the, and here are all kinds of, from somebody like Peter Berger, who would say, uh, I wear two hats when I'm a sociologist, I'm methodologically an atheist, but then I write a theological book. So he would always have two different arguments. I don't believe, and his own argument shows how these two hats are so interconnected. And uh, from this perspective to others that said, no, I, I simply present my, my prejudices. Uh, you could say only, I mean, when, when Max Weber said, I'm religiously unmusical, it's nonsense. If he would have been religiously unmusical, he wouldn't have spent so much time studying this music. Other thing is that he had prejudices about what he was studying that appear very clearly in how he listened to this music. But he did listen to this music very, 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 very seriously. Um, so uh, it's a very complex question, but it's not different, I would say, from uh, the problem of studying practically uh, human phenomena in general. Right. If I could, yeah, I, part of the question then is kind of historicizing uh, how the social sciences get constructed as sciences, right? I mean, why is it that these disciplines that are, in, in my opinion, you know, kind of based in a kind of humanistic uh, mm -hmm. framework, why uh, do they reach for the language of science uh, in order to kind of gain a certain kind of purchase in the in the academic world, uh, we had a conference. Uh, I'd run a center in Chicago. We had a conference on Pentecostal charismatic movements in the global South, and had this very interesting panel where um, uh, a professor from Zimbabwe <coughs> stood up and um, he said, "Okay, I want everybody in the room to raise your hand." And we all kind of raised our hand and we're looking at each other. He said, I feel there's somebody in this room here with uh, a bad back that need, need, needs healing. And we're all going to pray and bring that healing power down. Um, and then we're all kind of looking at each other with our hands sort of halfway up. And then he launches into his paper, which is all Foucault, Habermas, um, and secular social science is kind of reading these phenomena from a completely kind of uh, social scientific point of view. And I asked him later, um, you were kidding about that, wasn't he? I said, of course I was kidding. I was mocking, you know, mocking uh, uh, Pentecostalism. Right after his paper was a, a woman who teaches at the University of Indiana, very, Indiana University, very secular kind of religious studies department in which she gives a paper on Vincent McNabb and, and is arguing uh, that we need to take these phenomena seriously as phenomena and not try to reduce them down to something else. And so you see um, what kind of gains prestige in different contexts. In Zimbabwe, you gain prestige in a university context by 
rejecting the, the idea that you should take this stuff seriously and you reduce it down to something else. Whereas in a, in a where American secular university today anyway, you can gain uh, prestige by opening up the possibility that there are these kind of phenomena that ought to be taken seriously. So um, to me, uh, that sort of incident kind of uh, made me realize that you've always got to put this question of methodology into uh, historical context and ask kind of why is it that people are reaching for uh, scientific uh, kind of certainty in, in areas where it might not be If I uh, may add, I was fortunate to study uh, in Germany theologische Wissenschaft. They call it theological science. In Germany, theology is one of the Wissenschaft. But of course, Wissenschaft means literally knowledge production which is a much broader notion than uh, science in the positive sense. So it is a form of knowledge production. The question is which types of knowledge have higher prestige than others, and we're entering the whole question of, of knowledge and power and disciplinary divisions. So yes, it is it's very much along these lines, yes. So my question maybe bridges a little bit from this previous question. Uh, so I studied religion and the environment, and sort of bridge from social sciences to the humanities in doing so. And what I find is that a lot of my social science colleagues, the first question people are interested in is, well, who's more environmental, a Methodist or a Buddhist or, or so, something like that, right? As though the difference is something denominational or something confessional, there's, there's an idea that tells you to be more environmental in your particular religion and therefore you'll act that out. And I tend to think that's the wrong question, not just because the research that's been done sort of makes that look confusing, but also because my, my own experience of it has been that I think people's level of religious engagement or level of devotion, if you will, when you have similar levels of taking religion seriously between dialogue partners, they're going to have a better conversation than someone who sort of dismisses religion versus someone who's very serious about it. Uh, and I think that across a bunch of different religious categories, people who are very serious about God or devotion to God may see that this is God's creation and so I will be respectful of it. And that just seems like a no-brainer for someone who's very devoted, whereas that idea may not hold much purses for someone who doesn't take belief very seriously. So the, anyway, the, the, the question though, and maybe this is a theology matters kind of question, um, you mentioned Wilfred Cantwell Smith and the idea of religion was sort of invented as a category. I, I may be referring to the same work. It, it seemed to me that he, he was looking at titles of literature over time and, and that you know, what we used to have was a focus on God in the title. So we wrote about God and then that shifted and we wrote about religion or, or, or Christianity and then that shifted and more of the titles were focused on different categories of Christianity, if you will, Lutheranism or you know, and, and, the, and the idea was there was this reification away from actually focusing on God to talking about religious categories and even specific identities within religion. So there's this movement of what the focus is, of what, at least of what people are writing about as reflected in titles of literature uh, across that period of time uh, where it seems like people are just not paying as much attention to God anymore, but we're sure paying attention to the political categories of our denominations. And I wonder if you have any comment about that kind of movement and what kind of a difference that makes, if, if, there's a, if that's a shift in what religion means, if that's a shift in what's actually going on in communities, is that a shift in how power and status works? I, 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 did, I hadn't thought about this until you mentioned that. I hadn't thought about this as also the invention of religion, if you will, as the focus of a term. I'd been thinking of it as this sort of fade away from the spiritual experience of interaction with the divine and it's gradually moving away from that. Yeah, gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I suppose one of the reasons for that is that people are less confident that God exists, and so you can't, uh, so you say that you can't talk about God anymore, you can just talk about the way people behave around the idea of God, because you can see empirically that religious people exist, but you can't see empirically uh, that uh, God exists, and um, and I haven't actually thought about that. So that I mean that that's one of the kind of stories that we tell about modernity is that we've kind of lost 
uh, lost faith in the transcendent and now um, we're, we stick to the, to the imminent and that's, um, and then it's only kind of theologians who are, you know, kind of speculating um, that, that can talk about God, um, but it's a, it's a discourse of a completely different uh, matter. Uh, and I suppose I, you know, I, I would want to contest uh, that idea that this is of a completely different, uh, different order of, of um, being that, that we're kind of speculating. I, I tend to think, you know, don't tell me that I have beliefs and you have facts. Just tell me what you believe. I'll tell you what I believe, and then we can have a conversation about it. Um, but um, I suppose if you look at the at the same time period that this is happening, um, you might that this idea of the migration of the holy might be useful as well. Is that the reason that we have many more books about uh, nation states than about gods uh, is because the holy has migrated from God to the to the nation state um, in in this way. Um, that I suppose from an orthodox point of view might be considered uh, just idolatry, right? And in, and in some sense, this is nothing new, you know. But partly also has to do with, I mean, on the one hand, when you started with why the emphasis, the emphasis on Methodists and Buddhists, social scientists like to have dependent independent variables, and they, they, they deal, this is what you do, right? Instead of beginning with, with a much more different type of phenomenological analysis is to the question of the categories. Uh, let's not forget that Smith actually is only looking at either Latin or, or, or uh, English language. I mean, religion doesn't appear in German. It's Glauben until very recently. The category of religion only emerges very, very late in, in, in 19th century, probably, as, as this general category. So again, those things from language, Secularism is a very Anglo-Saxon and Protestant category, not a, 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 a Latin one. We use laicite because it has to do with laicism and against priests. So even those categories, them, and then when you begin to translate them and how they travel to non-Western countries, then you enter into a very different. I mean, at the very same time that uh, Smith is saying how this category is shifting in the West, there's my interest in the Jesuits. They come to China and then they, they, there is no stable category. They use sim sometimes they talk of faiths, sometimes they, call, they talk of laws, sometimes they talk of teachings, sometimes they talk of doctrines. So, and you know, in the same, I mean, you Matteo Ricci in the same text will use this. Uh, so there is no stable category uh, very clearly. And so, uh, and then how do you deal with it? And of course, as you know, the, 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 all the question about Chinese rights is what is religion, what is not religion. Once they define those ancestor rights as not religion, but civil rituals, not because therefore it's not idolatry. So the very differentiation of what is religion and not religion, a, a, a civil, a, which then the Enlightenment will essentialized, actually comes out of uh, the attempt of Matteo Ricci to come to terms with Confucianism, and he invents Confucianism to a certain extent. So again, uh, those, and even Smith points out that actually Islam is the only religion that actually already emerges with the category of religion. In the Quran, uh, uh, Allah says, I give you one religion. So one religion among others. So in the Quran is the first place where appears the category of religion, of which the one I give you is the true one and is other. And it's the only religion that has already the name from the very beginning, as opposed to others that the name comes much later. So again, those things are in context. And again, <coughs> context. You cannot uh, uh, develop those things in the abstract uh, context, both spatial and temporal, to, to really to understand how those things change. And, Dynamics of it. Kentwell Smith uses that. I mean, he, he says that the uh, Arabic word din is a partial exception to this, but um, I think more recent stuff like Brent Nongbri's book on uh, Before Religion kind of deconstructs that and says, no, that's not really, that's not really religion in, this, in the same no, sense. No, so, no yeah. the same word yeah. can be mean very different things. Yeah. Religio was a pre-Christian category of Rome, but it made radically different that when, when, when San Agustine, the Vera Religione, and then, and then how a category that is Latin, but doesn't appear in Byzantium. Byzantine Christianity has not the category of religion. 
That's why they use the Latin word today in all the Slavic languages don't have a category. Greek doesn't have a category of religion, right? So yeah, this was a, originally a Latin word, but then it was transformed by, by, by Western Christianity, not by, by Western Christianity, and then it was, of course, transformed. So the question, one thing is the genealogy of the word, but the same word means radically different things across different periods of time. So. Um, could you comment, <coughs> pardon me, on the historical use of religion by the state to provide political stability, uh, stability and I'm thinking in this case in the utilization by the Catholic Church of uh, excommunication and the uh, Inquisition or uh, Islamic Jihad where the government is using religion for its own purposes? I guess yeah. the Inquisition, I will begin with the Inquisition since I come from Spain. <laughs> no one well, expects the Inquisition the was established to combat heresy within the Christian world. It was the Spanish state that brought, at first, the, Spain got the Inquisition very late. Uh, the Kingdom of Aragon could not allow the Inquisition in the 13, 14, only the Catholic kings were the ones that established it, purely as a state institution for uh, controlling the new Christians, the converted Jews. So the Inquisition had the, the, the function of basically uh, disciplining the new Christians. And this was originally the real issue. It was very little against uh, Christian heresy per se. Um, well, we know that until Vatican II, the Catholic Church had accepted the notion that uh, the norm should be a confessional state, an established uh, state church, and that the state should basically use coercion to impose one single religion and to uh, eliminate others. I mean, in Spain, uh, of the way through the Franco regime, this was the norm. And the Spanish bishops went to the Vatican Council believing that this was the, the Catholic norm, and then came back telling Franco, no, it's not anymore like that. And it was a shock, right? For the, for the Catholic bishops, uh, the Spanish one, all of them were against the notion of religious freedom in the Vatican, in Vatican II. So uh, this was a radical transformation within the Catholic Church, the acceptance of the notion that it is not the task of the state to protect the true religion. Before the notion was error has no rights, only truth has rights. And since we know who has the truth, which is the Catholic Church, the others are errors and therefore have no rights. Once it changes from error has no rights to persons have rights, not doctrines have rights, but persons, then you radically change the dynamic. And so the question is then to develop notions of a state that has no business defining true versus false religion or defining for that matter true versus false ideology or the life world that its citizens should have, whether Marxist or utilitarian or whatever. So uh, this is a, a fundamental transformation from the state that imposes one religion upon the subject to one which basically within some constraint, but of course we could say, well, but it's a liberal state. A liberal state imposes liberalism as a religion. Yes, it's, uh, to a certain extent you can say that, but, but there, is a, there is, I would argue, a difference between that and the one in which you have really a confessional state imposing one which basically forces all the citizens to differentiate between those who are uh, the true citizens and those who are not. But uh, I don't know whether this answers your, your question. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 but I think, I mean, I, I think that's right. Um, but it's you need to complicate the history a little bit more than that because to say that everything is a, con a confessional state until the modern era is not really right. No, no, I mean, no, you don't no, have no, no. You, you don't have states until you know late Middle Ages at the at the best. Um, and until until that time, you've got civil authority and you've got ecclesiastical authority, but they're in constant tension with each other. And sometimes the civil authority is on top, and sometimes the ecclesiastical authority is on top. And so you've got, you know, the period uh, leading up until the uh, investiture controversy in um, in the 11th century, where um, it's the 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 king is in control of the church, and then the investiture controversy rests control um, back to the church, and for the next couple of centuries, the, it's the pope is more powerful than, than the kings and so on. This kind of back and forth then, I think, is finally resolved. One way of reading what happens in early modernity in the rise of the, of the state 
is that the civil authority finally wins its kind of ultimate triumph over the ecclesiastical authority, and that's precisely why the concept of religion is born, right? Because the concept of religion means that you, church people, here, here's your little category of life, and you go over there and do that, and we have now the civil authority has full control of the public, uh, of, of the public sphere. So, um, uh, so I, I think that um, that needs to be something that um, that is uh, is nuanced uh, in that way. But if I may, we need to have some uh, uh, also debate among ourselves and differences. Obviously, for me, crucial is the decision of Augustine to legitimate coercion to force the people into the church. And this, is, this is comes already very early in Western, in Western Christian theology, and, and this will have tremendous repercussions for the theology of coercion, uh, of forcing people to accept the truth, because we have the truth. And second, uh, yes, uh, the, it's the Leviathan, right? From now on, it is the sovereign that determines the religion of the subjects. Uh, and it is perhaps. But again, it's very different which kind of Leviathan. A Lutheran Leviathan is one in which you have a much closer, insofar as uh, Lutheran theology uh, desacralizes the church. The, the church with civilists becomes simply a state institution, and religiosity becomes then the true religion, the interior religiosity. So the Lutheran is very different from the Calvinist, from the, from the Catholic, and here, uh, even until today, that the dynamics between what we could call the state sacred let's call it civil religion, versus the ecclesiastical religion, have radically different dynamics in Lutheran context, in Calvinist context, and in, in Catholic context. So those are very complex stories, yes. Yeah, and one of the interesting things about the Reformation is that the Reformation succeeds in places where um, the state had not yet taken over control of the church, and it fails in places where the church, where the state had already taken over the church. So France and Spain uh, were already firmly in the, the crown was firmly in control of the church, um, and so the Reformation failed there because it wasn't to the civil authorities' advantage. And it succeeds in places like Sweden and so on, where it, there was every advantage to, um, to, to, to for the state to take over control of the uh, of the church in that way. Yeah. We have time for one more brief question with brief responses, so uh, yeah, please. Yes. <clears throat> I, uh, I'm very uh, excited being here, first of all. Uh, it's very calming to be in a place where people can discuss uh, a topic such as religion or whatever you want to call it in peace. <laughs> uh, my question is to you both, having uh, uh, achieved all the diplomas and expertise that you now have, but in the beginning of your journey, how did you deal with your own personal biases or biases when entering this, your chosen field? I've never had any biases. <laughs> <laughs> so you want, you want us so to I confess? <laughs> I, I'll confess. I'll confess. I tell you, I tell you uh, uh, I'm here today because um, as a boy in a village, in a very, in, under the Franco regime, basically secluded village, came a missionary from Africa, a uh, Catholic missionary, who is a European colonial missionary still in Africa, missing one arm and say, telling us this big story that actually a crocodile had eaten his, his. And I came home saying, Mommy, I want to go to Africa uh, to, uh, to, to give my, my, my arm for uh, black souls. And my mother, no education, it was not uh, degrees, uh, always thought that to be Catholic means to be universal. Yes, my son. So encouraged me to be Catholic, not in the Roman Catholic sense, but in other sense of being Catholic. So, yeah. You kept your arm, though. So this is, this is <laughs> as confessional as it gets. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a constant. I um, grew up in a context where um, it was the kind of just the first generation out of the sort of really ethnic Catholic ghetto. Um, my dad was half Irish and half Polish and grew up in Chicago where, you know, if you crossed over into the Italian neighborhood, you got beat up and, and that sort of thing. And Chicago is a very kind of segregated place. Um, so I guess uh, I grew up with a lot of those kind of prejudices too, and it's a constant kind of attempt at conversion. You know, I think living in South America and um, and 
traveling in other places has been an attempt to, to kind of um, uh, overcome some of those uh, uh, early biases as well. But it's a, you know, it's a, if I think for all of us, so overcoming our, being aware of our biases is, uh, is a daily, daily job. We have by design a generous amount of time before the next panel begins. Uh, please stay for the next panel, which will be equally excellent. Um, but please take advantage of that break if you like to talk with our panelists about issues that have come up you were discussed here uh, in the public part of the forum. Uh, before we do that, though, please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.